Jim McKee's Complete History of Lincoln is made possible by the generous support of Speedway Properties. Good afternoon and welcome to the Preservation Association of Lincoln Brown Bag Lecture Series. My name is Eileen Burke and I'm the coordinator of these brown bags. If you're interested in these programs, please join our membership. To join, you can go to preservelincoln.org, which is our website. We are beginning a series of lectures today with Jim McKee. Support for this series is provided by Speedway Properties. Please join me in welcoming Clay Smith and Ken Fudron from Speedway Properties for their generous, generous support of the videotaping and other expenses associated with this series. Do you want to say a few things? Thank you. It's always fun to be among friends. On behalf of my parents, Bill and Joyce Smith, and the entire Smith family, and all of our 325 associates at Speedway Motors and Speedway Properties, we are honored to underwrite this filming of Jim McKee's History of Lincoln series. We are excited about this series. Jim is an old friend of ours, and we think he's a local treasure. We believe his knowledge needs to be preserved and shared with future generations. Our family has saved many older buildings throughout downtown Lincoln, and we believe Powell's goal to support and protect historic properties and advance historic preservation education is really vital to our community. We have designed our underwriting support as a challenge grant, so this will allow everyone to step forward and join us in supporting Powell to ensure their good work continues going forward in the future. Thank you. So our speaker today is Jim McKee. Jim is a lifelong Lincolnite. His great-grandparents pioneered in Lancaster County in the 1870s. Jim has a bachelor's degree from UNL and operates J&L Lee Company, which is a publisher of regional books, as well as a coinery, a stamp and bullion dealership. Jim has written over a thousand articles and books on Lincoln and Nebraska history. Jim is on the Nebraska State Historical Society Board of Trustees, and he also serves on the City of Lincoln Historic Preservation Commission. He is also a founding member of the Preservation Association of Lincoln. We are beginning a series today of over 15 talks during the next couple of years with Jim, and the series is titled Jim McKee's Complete History of Lincoln, and this program is number one. Jim invites you to ask questions during the program. Please join me in welcoming Jim McKee. As somebody pointed out, it is a historic day because this is the first time I've ever had anything to do with anything digital. <laughs> uh, we may not get to the digital part of it today. We'll see how time progresses because I always start any series of lectures with the same lecture, and that is, why is Lincoln the capital of Nebraska? and why is it named Lincoln instead of something else. So uh, the slide that the audience is looking at here has nothing whatever to do with that. <laughs> uh, you will be seeing uh, through the course of the lectures, you will be seeing the slides that are seen on the DVD, but you will be seeing them with uh, not cropped, so they have things around them as well. And if you have a question while I'm talking, ask it then, and we will also leave time at the end for questions as well. Uh, for this part, uh, we will go back to uh, early Nebraska at the point in time where it becomes a territory. 1854, the Nebraska Territory is formed along with the Kansas Territory. And at that point, for the first time, it becomes legal for people to permanently settle in the territory. People had been waiting across the river pretty much in Iowa, waiting for that time. And in fact, many of them had been coming across the river like on a Sunday afternoon over to the area where Omaha City will be formed and saying, this is where I want property ultimately. So they were coming over, maybe having a picnic and staking out in their own mind where they wanted their property to be. But of course, they couldn't settle uh, technically here permanently. The only people who were settled here at all were a few missionaries, a few fur traders, and of course, the Mormons had permission from the federal government and the indigenous American Indians to settle uh, at Florence. Uh, but those were special exceptions. So with the establishment of the territory in 1854, we have a huge area of land, uh, which in, is called Nebraska originally, 
It encompasses all of the Nebraska and Kansas states as we know them today. Uh, it includes uh, great portions of Colorado, Wyoming, Montana, uh, bits of Utah, uh, the western half roughly of North and South Dakota. So a vast territory, even bigger than Texas. Uh, or, or Alaska. Uh, and uh, the Louisiana Purchase, you'll remember, literally doubled the size of the United States at that point in time. And in 1803, this is one of the reasons that the President sent Lewis and Clark at their Corps of Discovery uh, to the West. They were charged with one, uh, making an association in contact with the American Indians who were here, uh, looking at the flora and fauna and recognizing it, labeling it in some cases. Uh, one of the things they were charged with doing, one of the very important things, was planting the American flag. This is one of the ways of saying this is our territory. But maybe one of the overriding reasons that we kind of forget today is they were looking for the Northwest Passage. They wanted a way of uh, connecting the eastern United States, uh, the area to the east of the Mississippi and Missouri Rivers, with the Western Sea or the Pacific Ocean. At that point in history, uh, the fastest people could travel was basically by water. You could travel faster for brief periods of time on horseback. Uh, the Pony Express is a good example of that. But basically, people were traveling at this point at 3.5 miles an hour. That's how fast you walk. And in fact, if you reckon back to the uh, days of the covered wagon and the movies, the westerns, where you see uh, the wagon train moving and dad's riding along on his horseback, uh, and mom and the kids and grandma are sitting in the wagon riding along. Uh, this is not how it happened at all. Uh, basically, everybody walked, and they walked at three and a half miles an hour. Uh, and the reason for this was they needed to save the oxen. Everything was based on the oxen. They didn't start west on their journey in the spring until the grass was high enough for the oxen to eat. So they will bunch up at like Nebraska City or Old Wyoming and wait for the grass to get green. Uh, they're waiting for the snows to melt as well, but basically they want enough grass for the oxen to eat. And this is why they stop for over an hour at noon and have a long break over the night too. The oxen can rest. So if you uh, think of that, two, three and a half miles an hour, it also will factor into the equation of why Lincoln is the capital a little bit later on. Um, and as I said, there were no railroad trains, nothing else. So people were traveling basically at three and a half miles an hour. So the vast area that we see Nebraska at that point in time as a territory is going to begin shrinking almost at once. And it begins shrinking with the establishment of other territories, like the Colorado Territory, the Dakota Territory, which was one territory, uh, and so forth, until we come up to 1867. And in 1867, Nebraska will become the 37th state in the Union. And as it assumes that uh, point in time, we also find that the state of Nebraska's shape will almost be the same as it is today. Uh, we will inherit uh, or assume a fairly good tract of land from South Dakota up around Kiapaha County, for example. We'll also gain and lose land as the Missouri River uh, moves to the east and the west uh, and, the, and the boundaries of Nebraska change to the point at one point uh, in history we actually had a school district of Nebraska that was on the other side of the river. Uh, which was a little bit confusing, but nonetheless, by 1867, with statehood, we find that Nebraska is, if you think of the state of Nebraska today, you will really have a picture of it at that point in time. Now, at that point in time, we find that we are uh, confronted with the fact that in 1854, when Governor Burt became the first territorial governor, he was appointed by the president, by the way. He was not elected by the people. Uh, in fact, Governor Burt was the first choice to become the territorial Nebraska uh, governor. And when the president approached him, he immediately said no. Uh, his wife didn't want to settle out here. Uh, so the president went on to his second choice and third choice, and finally it was very obvious that he was having a tough time. And he went back to Francis Burt from the Carolinas and asked him uh, again, and this time he acquiesced and said he would become the first territorial governor. It took him weeks to travel from his home in the, in the Carolinas to uh, Nebraska, and he used virtually every known means of travel at that point in time. He walked, he rode by wagon, he rode on horseback, he was on water. Everything was encompassed. Uh, he arrived at St. Louis completely exhausted and really rather ill, enough that he waited there a number of days, uh, maybe as much as a week, just to recover and recuperate and head on up the river, Missouri River, 
to about the only place uh, on the territory uh, which really had enough population to even be considered a, a city, and that was Bellevue. And at Bellevue, he intended to establish the capital city, uh, and it was up to him to appoint this point. He could just choose it. Um, he stopped there at the Presbyterian Mission and was uh, greeted by Father Hamilton. Uh, then he's about to become uh, the territorial governor. He takes the oath of office. He's still exhausted. He goes to bed uh, to rest a little bit more, and he becomes Nebraska's favorite governor of all times. Uh, because he goes to bed, two days later, he dies. Uh, so he made no bad laws, he made no bad appointments, very popular guy. And he also never put in writing the fact that he intended Bellevue to be the capital. At that point in time, it's going to fall to a man by the name of Thomas Cumming, who is not an, uh, the assistant to the governor, uh, but rather he will assume the title of governor or acting governor of uh, the Nebraska Territory, and he will decide to put the territorial capital in Omaha City. And one of the primary reasons he did this, we think in looking back, is the fact that one, he owned land there, so it was to his advantage. Uh, and secondly, he also had a building there. But he did it, he put it there. Now I also, as you think of Nebraska, uh, think of the Platte River. And in your mind's eye, think of it running as a horizontal line, literally dividing Nebraska in half. And we call these halves at that time the North Platte and the South Platte. And the people think of themselves it that way. Uh, Omaha is north, by the way. It is in the North Platte section. Uh, at that point in time, the governor is also charged with establishing the legislative districts, and there are two houses in the legislature at that time, uh, and also taking a census. And with the census, we find, the first census, we find that approximately twice the population, twice the property, twice the number of churches, twice the number of cattle, twice almost everything is south of the river. So the North Platte, if you will, is the lesser part. Nonetheless, Governor Cumming assigns districts so that there are twice as many legislative districts north of the Platte than there are south of the Platte, which gives them a distinct advantage in the lower house. Uh, this angers the people to the south to the point where one of our friends, Jay Sterling Morton, uh, tries to get together enough people to take the South Platte, everything below the Platte River, secede from Nebraska, and join the Union as part of Kansas. He went down to Kansas and uh, presented his problem, and it probably would have worked because the South Platte people were that angry. The only thing that didn't work was Kansas was uninterested in the proposition, so that didn't work. So now, uh, as we come into the Union, uh, we will find that we have the state again, just about the state we are in today. But the people south of the Platte are considerably irritated. Uh, this is going to go forward, and as it goes forward, of course, the people south of the Platte continue to have the uh, upper hand in population and so forth. Uh, and t time has progressed now from the territory days to the statehood days. Uh, and at this point in time, there is enough of a faction in the South Platte that is trying desperately to get the capital moved out of Omaha. They think they've been hoodwinked. Uh, and in the legislature at that time, there's also a bill pending which says that if the capital of Nebraska is for whatever reason, whenever moved to whatever spot it might be moved to, that the name of the new capital of Nebraska will be Capital City which, if you stop to think about it, will be a good deal because uh, everybody would remember the capital city of Nebraska at that point in time. Now, we know the capital very clearly, but if you were to ask uh, junior high school students in New York State what the capital of Nebraska is, probably they would say Omaha. But we get even by, if you ask our kids uh, what the capital of New York is, they're probably going to say New York City. So uh, we get even with them. But nonetheless, that's the way it is set up. And the division in the upper house at that point in time about whether to move the capital is almost exactly 50-50. Uh, the man who is uh, kind of in charge of the Omaha faction, in other words, should we move the capital out of Omaha, the Omaha faction wants to keep it there, and that man is a name by the name of J.N.H.N. Patrick, who is in the legislature, uh, and he's, we'll call him the head of the uh, Let's Keep the Capital in Omaha campaign. And the man who is uh, heading up the other side uh, is a man by the name of Mills Reeves, and he is from Nebraska City. Uh, a very uh, well thought of man, an intelligent man, 
he does have one little uh, character flaw, however, and it is known about by Mr. Patrick, who, remember, knows that the division is almost exactly 50-50. So he's reasoning in his own mind that if we can get one or two votes from the South Platte to our side, we'll keep the capital in Omaha. Now, the thing that Mills Reeves uh, had in his character was that in Nebraska City, we find, looking at the census, because Nebraska can make the, uh, its choice, we have slaves. Uh, and sometimes we see there may be a dozen or as many as 20 or 30 slaves held in Nebraska. Virtually all of them are in Nebraska City. So even though we tend to think of Nebraska City in terms of apples and John Brown's cave, which is mere fabrication, by the way, um, nonetheless, in Nebraska City, we have slaves held. And it's kind of uh, hard to figure this because this is a station on the Underground Railway where escaped slaves from the South are aided in getting across the river and ultimately into Canada. So we have these two factions. Uh, and in fact, in Nebraska City, some very well-known people are pro-slavery, including J. Sterling Morton uh, and Mr. Knuckles, who gets a county named after him, for heaven's sakes. These are pro-slavery people who own slaves. Uh, Mr. Knuckles, in fact, at one point pursues two of his uh, slaves who escaped. He pursues them to Chicago to get them back. So uh, now Mills Reeves is also on this side. Uh, in fact, Mills Reeves is one of the people who in the United States dislikes Abraham Lincoln. And we think today, we look back and think everyone loved Abraham Lincoln. But in fact, his uh, elections were pretty close. He was never an overwhelming uh, candidate for the presidency. He, he was elected, but not overwhelmingly. And we find that people uh, either loved him basically, or they pretty much hated him. And Mills Reeves was one of those people who hated him. And of course, the people who owned slaves and the people in the South were on that side of the equation as well. They did not like Abraham Lincoln. And in fact, at one point, uh, Mr. Reeves had stood upon the floor of the legislature and spoken against Abraham Lincoln. So Senator Patrick knows that, and he's going to use that in his favor. Now, the Capitol itself uh, stood at that time, the Territorial Capitol Building, stood at the top of Capitol Avenue. Capitol Avenue is still there. It runs from the Missouri River uh, towards the west and at the top of a hill where we now have Jocelyn Art Gallery and uh, Omaha Central High School, we had the Territorial Capitol. Uh, in fact, it stood almost precisely where uh, Lincoln, excuse me, Omaha Central High School stands today. There, in fact, is a courtyard in the building, which is the exact site. Uh, and it was an interesting building, very poorly constructed, as most of the buildings that we were putting together at that time were. Uh, but it did have some interesting characteristics. Uh, for example, in the basement, it had a saloon, which is a pretty handy thing. Uh, maybe we ought to look back at that. I don't know. Uh, but the people who were in the legislature at that time, too, were a pretty rowdy bunch for the most part. Many of them had come from Iowa, just come across the river. Uh, they were not necessarily... Um, high-powered businessmen or attorneys or anything. They're just people who came across the river and settled in Nebraska. Uh, so one of the things, for example, that the sergeant at arms, one of his duties was to preserve order, and one of the ways to preserve order was to make sure that the legislators, as they came into the chambers, was to remove their rifles and shotguns uh, and check them. But they never bothered to check or remove revolvers or pistols. Uh, so one of the things that happens is we see this as a really kind of a rowdy, bunch of people, as I said. And the press, for example, came in and mingled. They would sit at the legislators' desks with them. Uh, it was apparently common. Harper's Magazine had an article one time where it said that the legislators were just very apt to be sitting at their desks with their feet up on the desk and maybe whittling at the same time things were going on. It was a raucous thing, uh, and people would be talking all the time so that if a senator or a representative wanted to get the eyes of the Speaker of the House, uh, he would sometimes fire a shot into the ceiling. Uh, effective, I'm sure. Uh, now, the desks that they sat at, you can see one upstairs up on the second floor, uh, and they were about four foot wide. Two senators sat at each desk. So they were rather small. Uh, it was uh, a small group. And we also know that sometimes, that in their enthusiasm, that the senators would even jump up on their tables to get the eye of the speaker. And now we find Senator Patrick uh, making his move. Remember, he wants to get one or two votes. So he gets the eye of the speaker 
and makes a motion to amend the existing motion, which, remember, said that if the capital is ever moved out of Omaha City, it will be named Capital City. So he gets the eye of the speaker, and he makes a motion to amend the existing motion and replacing the word capital with the word Lincoln because he knows that Mills Reeves and the faction from Nebraska City will now vote against it because they won't want Abraham Lincoln's name in association with the state of Nebraska. And if he can get those two or three people, he figures he can keep the capital in Omaha. So he makes the motion to amend the motion, substituting the word Lincoln for capital. Now at this point in time, we read from the Omaha Herald primarily that at that point, Senator Reeves jumps upon his desk in an attempt to get the eye of the speaker. Uh, and we don't know for sure what's going on in his mind, but he was a politically savvy man, and he probably realized how close the vote was, and he may have known. All we know is that everybody in the chamber assumed that when he got the eyes of the speaker, that he would argue strongly against the word Lincoln. To everyone's surprise, when he got up on the, on the table and got the floor, instead of arguing against it, he seconded the motion, which set in motion sort of a, a, a quick acceptance. So suddenly, if the capital is going to move out of Omaha, it will be renamed Lincoln. Probably stunned people just a little bit. Now at this point in time, the legislature has also made a couple of, of, of other little uh, directions. They have also said that the governor may appoint a capital commission. Then it was AL. And I think the capital commission today is OL. Is that correct? Uh, at that time, the capital commission, and one of the things they would be charged with is determining if the capital is moved, where it might move to. Uh, the governor is empowered to form this commission. And I always say that since he found out there was per diem, he immediately appointed himself. It's going to be a three-man commission. He will appoint himself um, John Gillespie, uh, who was the auditor of Nebraska, and Thomas Perkins Kennard, who was the Secretary of State. Thomas Perkins Kennard comes from the city of Kennard. Go figure that out. It was named for him, but we pronounce it Kennard today, just like we mispronounced Beatrice for another reason. And just in the last year or so, I've discovered that uh, Beatrice Fitch Kinney for whom the town was named, pronounced her own name, Beatrice. And that sort of escaped people. So we've tried to come up with a whole lot of reasons why we pronounce it Beatrice. But in fact, Beatrice did pronounce her own name that way. So, and we've ruined a lot of names by pronunciation. Um, so we've got the governor having appointed this three-man commission. Uh, and they are charged very specifically with looking at land in a very specific area. Now, the uh, legislature has been looking at maps of Nebraska, both as a territory, even before that. And they have discovered that in the various explorers that come through, Spanish, French, and so forth, that many of them have labeled Nebraska with certain things, like the rivers. But one of the things they have noticed is that if you would draw a line pretty much north to south along the western edge of Lancaster County, roughly speaking, uh, that there is a huge amorphous sort of an area to the northwest of there called the Great American Desert. The Great American Desert still exists today. It's the largest desert of its type in the world. It's still there. We call it the Sand Hills. Uh, at that time, they thought it pretty much came down and impinged upon Lancaster County, which we know it does not and did not then either. Uh, but the legislature notices that as people enter the state and begin to settle, that they have first settled along what they call the eastern seacoast of Nebraska, which is the Missouri River, and sort of slowly moved from the eastern seacoast or the Missouri River towards the west, but slowly. And the legislature looking at this map sees the great American desert out there, and they say, well, if we're going to move the capital, let's move it as far as anybody's ever going to live, because one of those maps on it says the great American desert west of this line, no man will ever live, nothing will ever grow. So it was a great <laughs> deterrent to settlement in addition to the fact that the, indeed the Great American Desert was there. Uh, so they figure if we're going to move the capital, let's move it up to that line. And, and in so doing, we'll never have to visit this question again of moving the capital. And if we look back at the counties of Nebraska as they're formed, 
we find that many, many of them, maybe close to half of them, have moved their county seats at least once. For example, Saunders County. If you look, it started down in Ashland, which is nowhere near the center of the county. And remember, we're traveling at three and a half miles an hour, so they pick it up and they move it up to Wahoo. And if you look, it's actually down in a corner of Lancaster County. It's so far away from the center. So this idea of putting uh, your capital, and whether it's the capital of the county or the capital of the state, near the center of population makes good sense, uh, simply because people are moving at a very slow rate of mind. Because if you lived in the panhandle of Nebraska and had to come to uh, something in the Capitol building to appear uh, for a committee or a bill, it was a long, long journey. You could almost go from Richardson County in a straight line clear up to the uh, panhandle and travel almost 500 miles. Uh, and so three and a half miles an hour figured out. It's a long distance. So this uh, legislature very carefully prescribes where uh, the Capital Commission might look for land. Um, now they're going to set out, they're going to get together, the three members, and they're going to take with them um, other people. There are going to be two members of the press from the Omaha Herald going to go with them. And also a man by the name of August, sometimes his name is called Augustus, but August Harvey. He's going to become very prominent uh, in the state of Nebraska, uh, the University of Nebraska. Uh, he's going to leave his imprint, if you will, on a lot of things. He is, for example, a man who surveyed and planted the city of Nebraska City. Very, very smart guy. He was an attorney. Uh, he was an editor. He knew a lot of things. And it's also been said that if anybody on the Capitol Commission ever came up with an idea, it probably wasn't theirs. Uh, they, were, they, they were not necessarily the sharpest knives in the drawer, but at least the governor knew that. So they chose people for specific things, and they took along with them, but not as a member voting, but August Harvey. So we've got the three members of the Capitol Commission, August Harvey, and two members of the Omaha Press, uh, who will meet uh, in uh, Nebraska City at the Cincinnati Hotel on June the 18th of 1867, to go out and examine these properties. Now remember, it took Mr. Kennard uh, a while to get down and Omaha City. They're gonna con congregate there. And they're going to leave from the Cincinnati Hotel the following morning, head for the first site which they want to examine. Now, at that point in time, they're going to take an old Indian trail which connected Nebraska City, which had been known as Fort Kearney. But when they moved Fort Kearney further to the west to where we have Fort Kearney now and replaced Fort Childs. This really gets confusing. We won't spend much time on that. But um, they're going to take a, tra a trail which partly was from Indians, partly was uh, what we call the Oregon Trail cutoff uh, because many people, instead of coming up through Fairbury on the Oregon Trail, which cut an angle, would come up the river. The further they could go up by a steamboat, the better, and they would leave from Nebraska City to head uh, towards the west and Fort Kearney. In fact, most of the government troops, most of the government provisions, most of the government mail went up to Nebraska City and headed west on the Oregon Trail cutoff. Uh, and this is the path which they'll take. It joins the Oregon Trail at Kearney, by the way. It comes pretty much in a straight line, not exactly. Um, this trail is later going to become a railroad trail, the Midland Pacific Railroad, which is now the uh, Burlington Railroad, which runs out along Highway 2 and also Highway 2. So it's going to have started with the American Indians trails. This is where they're going to go. And this part of the Oregon Trail cutoff, by the way, which was from Nebraska City to Fort Kearney, was one of the heaviest traveled portions of the entire Oregon Trail. So it was a good trail to take. Uh, they're going to, on the 19th, so they will have traveled only part of a day, probably, but they will get as far as a little uh, settlement, not even a town, called Nursery Hill. Now, Nursery Hill is close to, but not overlapping today, the city of Syracuse, to give it, give it a place in your mind's eye. That's how far they got in one day's travel, Nebraska City to uh, Nursery Hill. Now, it may be true they didn't start at the crack of dawn, <laughs> that I don't know, but that's as far as they got. And one of the reasons they stopped at Nursery Hill was because at Nursery Hill, there was a spot in the road where there was a cabin or a settler on each side of the trail. And they knew that there was no hotel, no Holiday Inn. There was nothing, that, no place they could stop. They stopped there. Uh, and they divided their party in half. Um, half went on one side, half went on the other. So three men went and knocked on the door of the cabin on one side of the trail and said, hi, we're the Capitol Commission. Can we spend the night, more or less? 
uh, and the other half went to the other side. And both were accepted. Uh, and the party then, uh, each side had a chronicler. And the governor was one of them, and uh, Thomas Perkins Kennards was one of them. They kept diaries. Unfortunately, in the case of Mr. Uh, Kennards' diary, for example, and for the governor's to, in some extent, they weren't written for almost a decade later. So they don't necessarily agree specifically. And we're going to look primarily at the governor's uh, diary because it was written a little before, we think, Kennards. But nonetheless, they were written in some cases after the fact. We have very, very little written evidence of what happened. But at this point in history, most of what I tell you now will be true for the rest of today because I'm going to have these two, two points. Up until now, I've been making this up pretty much out of whole cloth uh, and a pretty good story it is. But at any rate, the governor notes in his diary that that night when they split apart, his party went to one side of the trail and, and I don't know what the name of the people he stayed with. I don't know that. But he said each one of them was given supper and for dinner they had fat back, uh, which is, uh, you can probably best equate it to a cheap cut of bacon, fat back, beans and coffee. Uh, they were then each given a plank and a blanket. Now the plank was to lay across the rafters. The blanket wasn't to cover up because we're in you know, late June in Nebraska, it's not gonna be cold, that's their mattress. Uh, so they'll sleep there. Uh, the next day in the morning, they will come down and be given breakfast. And for breakfast, they will have coffee, beans, and fat back. And when they join the party from the other side, we find the same diet. This is what they had. So that's what they ate along with all of the uh, people that they were staying with. Uh, the next day, then, they will finally make it on the 20th uh, to what we call today Yankee Hill. And I presume you know where Yankee Hill is. It's a community. It's no longer, or still, I should say, still not part of Lincoln. Uh, it's outside the city and it's out near Pioneer Park. And if you can think of that big water tower that still stands out there, that's where Yankee Hill was and is. Uh, it will be the first city, if you will, that the Capitol Commission will investigate. They will stay with a man by the name of John Cadman. John Cadman had come to uh, Lancaster County in that area in 1864 with the first thought of becoming a farmer. But he almost immediately realized that farming was going to be a tough road to hold literally and uh, figuratively. Uh, the land wasn't that great right there. And so what he did was he established on the Oregon Trail cutoff, that same path that the Capital Commission took, he established a road ranch, R-A-N-C-H-E, or a stage station. Uh, and also at this point where it crossed Salt Creek is where the north-south Lushbaugh stage lines cross. So it was a very important trade intersection, if you will. And his uh, stage station or ranch, like the others, which went along the Oregon Trail and other trails as well, they occurred about every five to seven to ten miles, something like that. Uh, and these became what I like to compare to a intersection on the interstate because there you can stop, you can spend the night, uh, you can probably buy some food, uh, your oxen can graze. If you have a lame oxen, they probably have a used ox lot and you can trade your oxen in on a new one. Uh, there's almost always a freshwater well so that you can get water. Everything you would need is at that point point. and John Cadden does very well there. His stage station is uh, approximately, and we can find it, but it's not quite a half a mile south of Saltillo Road, if you remember where the acreage was, that sort of antique shop out there, uh, on Salt Creek, and it was off towards the city of Roca. He became pretty well to do. Now, too, at this point in time, I need to have you think of Lancaster County as a rectangle, and below it, another rectangle, which is Gage County. But in the territory of Nebraska, they didn't exist that way. There were, instead of two rectangles, one on top of the other, there were three squares. Lancaster County was a square. Then there was another square called Clay County, and below that, another square called Gage County. John Cadman lived in the edge of Clay County. And there was very little population there. There was really very little population in Lancaster or uh, Clay County. But John Cadman uh, is going to become well-known in the area as a practical joker and a political jokester, if you will. And one of the things he wants to do is he wants to represent in the territorial legislature and state legislature an area larger than Lancaster County with more population. 
And one of the things he reasons he can do is he can take Gage, or excuse me, Clay County, cut it in half, give the top half to Lancaster County, and the bottom half to Gage County, making the two rectangles we have today. So 1864, he's going to get this done. And one of the ways he gets this done is by going to everybody in the upper half of Clay County and saying to them, like the city of Olathe, which is a pretty good-sized city, it was almost directly west of Roca, which in now it's just absolutely plowed ground. But he went there and he told the people in Olathe, if you will vote to dissolve Clay County, I will put the county seat of the newly formed Lancaster County in Olathe. Then he went to every other community in the county and told them the same thing. So he made the promise multiply. At any rate, citizens of Clay County did vote to be dissolved in 1864. The county was dissolved. The records were to be sent to Gage County, were lost, their, their uh, wagon cop capsized in Salt Creek and we lost it. So we have almost no record of what really went on. They lost all the records. Now, John Cadman, is not very popular at that point in time. In some ways, he's still thought of in rather a negative way because he's promised this all over. And one of the things that happens is the people in Lancaster County say, well, he's pulled the wool over our eyes once, not going to happen again. So when they voted, instead of putting the county seat in Yankee Hill where he really, really, really wanted it, they put it in the city of Lancaster to show him he can't get away with that sort of thing. Okay, so it's a John Cadman's house that they're going to stop. And in our next session, we will see a picture of the house, which still pretty much still stands. Uh, his house is um, on today what uh, we would call West Calvert Street. It's also been known as Ponca Street and Old Cinder Road. Um, but it is the only house on the south side of Calvert Street between First Street and... Um, the road, that cutoff road that goes to Nebraska City, which is called uh, Salt Valley View or something like that road. I'm not sure. To find it, I'll give you a little bit of a, an advertisement. If you go out Van Dorn to where Speedway Motors used to be <laughs> and turn left, that's First Street. And if you go down First Street to the south, it dead ends at what's Calvert and it curves around and heads west. The only house that's on the south side is John Cadman's house, and you can still find it. And when we come back next month, same time, same station, we'll have a picture of it as well. But remember, turn left at the old speedway, right? Okay, Clay? <laughs> right, okay. Um, so this is the house. It's also an interesting house in that it starts life as a dugout, pretty much. Uh, many of the houses did. Uh, even those in, in the city of Lancaster started pretty much as dugouts. Easy, you dig into the side of a hill. But what they did was they dug into the side of the hill and then they went over to Roca and quarried stone so that they had sort of made a, think of a stone basement. You remember basement houses uh, up in World War II even? There were still quite a few basement houses around. University Place had a basement church. <laughs> Uh, so at that point in time, he had dug the stone in, made this, and then just put boughs of uh, uh, probably sod, more or less, over the top of it. And this is the house that the Capitol Commission is going to stay in, at least part of them. Some of them will stay at other homes in, in Yankee Hill. That house uh, is important because that's where the Capitol Commission stayed, but it's also important because we think probably, and we can't nail this down, probably the first school to be taught in Lancaster County was in that same dugout cabin. So that's where they're going to go. Uh, they're going to stay with John Cadman. Now John Cadman knew himself that Yankee Hill was probably odds on, odds on, I'll say it again, uh, the choice for the capital city uh, for Nebraska. One, it was probably the largest community. Uh, not quite a hundred people lived there. Uh, so it was the largest community that the Capitol Commission will look at. It is on that Oregon Trail cutoff. I think, importantly, it is also above the floodplain of Salt Creek. Uh, and they felt that probably everything they needed to start the Capitol would be there. Wherever they went, if they moved it out of Omaha City, it would have to be designed by fiat. There wasn't going to be much there. But probably Yankee Hill is going to be odds on the favorite, certainly going into the discussion. And John Cadman is going to do everything in his power to make sure that he wins this prize. He's lost the county seat prize, but he's going to keep that prize at all costs. Uh, that evening, uh, they are, the Capitol Commission is entertained by three young ladies from the area. 
which is noted by the press. Uh, they didn't, maybe they thought it was unfair, but nonetheless, they noted it in their minds. Uh, they will spend the night there, and uh, they are favorably impressed with Yankee Hill, but they've looked at no place else. So the next day, they're going to head for their next stop. Uh, they're going to go to uh, Lancaster. Now, Lancaster is easily available in one day. They're going to be there uh, the 22nd and the 23rd. Lancaster has some great advantages. Now, one of the things that the legislature has stipulated was that if they move the capital out of Omaha City, that wherever they move it to, the state must own or control approximately 550 acres of land. Now, the reason for that was the state treasury, think of it as starting with zero dollars. As a territory, most of the expenses of the territory are covered from Washington. But when you become a state, they become the responsibility of the populace of the state. And in fact, this is the reason that J. Sterling Morton, who was running against Mr. Butler, uh, the first governor of the state of Nebraska, this was Morton's contention, we can't afford to become a state. The Democrats said, we should stay a territory. The Republicans, Mr. Butler, won by 100 votes. And we became a state. Otherwise, we might still be a territory, who knows. Those 100 votes were in contention almost from the beginning. <coughs> because uh, the election officials allowed the federal troops, soldiers, if you will, who were going through Nebraska or stationed in Nebraska at that time to vote. And then, as now, the military was primarily Republican. So they think that the 100 votes that were from the winning side, a um, great many of them came from the soldiers and the people uh, connected to the federal government. In fact, the, the, the election was challenged on that basis. Uh, and the challenge still open, I guess. I don't know. It's never really decided. But nonetheless, that's how that came about. So now let's see where we're in Lancaster. We need 550 acres because it is the thought of the Capital Commission that if they move the capital out of Omaha, one of the things that they need to do is they get the, get the treasury going until tax money starts coming in, or they can sell land, which has been given to them by the federal government, now owned by the state. Uh, they can take this land, 550 acres, where the new capital might be located in. They can plat it, divide it up into blocks, divide the blocks up into lots. Then they can auction off the land, the lots, figuring that the people will all want to be in the capital city, so the lots will sell very well. They can use the money from the lot sales to finance the construction of the first capital building, first university, partially uh, the penitentiary and the insane asylum, and partially operate the state government until tax money starts coming in and, and land sales can occur. Uh, and it does work. Uh, but they're going to need that 550 acres roughly for that reason. Now, one of the things that Lancaster has going for it is that it was established in 1864 as the city of Lancaster by the Methodist Protestant Female Seminary Association, which came from Nebraska City. Uh, what they thought they were doing, it's hard to say, because they were bringing an institution which didn't exist. They were going to establish it in Lancaster County. Uh, and if they had done a def demographic survey, they would have seen that there were approximately 30 people living in the, in the close area around the city of Lancaster. And of those 30 people, there was one young lady of an age appropriate to the seminary. And she wasn't interested in the seminary. So it was doomed to failure before they started. But nonetheless, this was their thought. But by 1867, it is readily apparent the Methodist Protestant Female Seminary ain't going to work. It isn't going to get off the ground. They're going to build a stone building about where the Lincoln Journal building stands today. And we'll see that again in the next session, a photograph of it, pretty much. But the Methodist Protestant Female Seminary is basically seven or eight families that have come from Nebraska City. They have bought land and, and built homes here. But the association agrees to give the city to the state of Nebraska if they will bring the capital here. So this is an important inducement as far as the Capital Commission is concerned. Uh, this five, it won't be 550 acres, but the state controls enough extra land here that they will easily have the 550 acres. They also look out aside from Lincoln and they see the salt flats. And we'll talk about the salt flats again next time. The salt flats, the Capital Commission reasons, will be an economic industry which will support the capital. An industry will grow up from it. Because salt at that time is a very scarce commodity. 
uh, salt and flour trade at the same rate per pound. So they reason that this salt, and we will talk more about the salt next time too, but they reason the salt will, will, will form this industry. That doesn't work. Nonetheless, they're, they're that impressed with the city of Lancaster. They've got the two things that they really think they might need. And Captain Donovan, uh, his cabin was best described as being in the middle of the block where today we have the mill, coffee shop, and uh, uh, there's a, a tavern on the other end of it, on the northeast corner, okay? So it's roughly in that block, just kind of in the alley behind the mill, if you think of it that way, really. Okay, you got it. Uh, that's where his cabin is. Now, the next day, they're going to head for Ashland. It's going to take them more than a day to get to Ashland. In fact, they're going to stop on the way with a man by the name of Mr. Shirley, uh, who lives roughly on Stevens Creek, uh, before they get to Ashland. Ashland on the 24th. Uh, and at Ashland, uh, they find what Mr. Uh, Harvey says will make an acceptable physical capital site. In other words, the real estate. That later becomes the site of the Saunders County Courthouse, and it will be there until it is snatched away uh, by the city of Wahoo. So it does happen. That night, uh, they divide the party again. Uh, they're unable to find a place to stay easily, but there is an uncompleted, almost completed, uh, two-story brick building in what will become the downtown area of Ashland, and the owner says, you're welcome to spend the night here. Uh, so the governor says, okay, uh, I'm the senior member. Uh, I get to choose where I'm staying, and I'm going to stay on the ground floor, and the rest of you can stay upstairs, uh, which proved to be a good decision. Uh, so he goes to bed that night downstairs, and the rest of the commission and uh, the members of the press, and apparently Mr. Harvey, spend the night on the second floor. Now when the sun went down, down there in the valley around uh, Salt Creek uh, and the Platte River, when the sun goes down, something else happens then and now in the summertime. That is, the mosquitoes come out. Governor uh, Butler had chosen well because the ground floor has screens on the windows. Now, the Omaha Herald newspaper reporters make mention of this and say, last night, the governor, while the governor slept peacefully away downstairs, the party on the second floor spent a night of vigorous physical activity. Uh, they didn't sleep so well. And a little bit later on, we'll discover on their first ballot, there'll be one vote for Ashland and two opposed. Uh, nonetheless, they leave Ashland, uh, and then they head for the next spot they're going to examine. It's on the old California Trail. It's in Butler County. It's the home of a man by the name of J.D. Brown. And we know nothing about them. He, they're just spending the night there. They stop there, and they're heading next. Uh, for the 26th to an area near Camden, which is near Milford. Uh, and this is the spot where Oak Creek and Seward Creek uh, come together. This is the third spot which the legislature has specified that they might look at as acceptable sites. Uh, apparently, there was nothing to be said for the site because we find really nothing mentioned in any of their diaries about it. We don't see them explaining why they didn't choose it or whether there was anything good there or not. They apparently pitched their tents, stayed, and came back. Because uh, on the 27th, they're going to head back. The governor's diary says they go back to Saline City. Now, technically, Saline City is not Yankee Hill. Uh, Saline City uh, is the area to the north of Yankee Hill, where today we have the regional center. They were two separate cities. Kind of blurry out there. There were a lot of little communities at one time. Uh, but his diary says they went back to Saline City, but actually they went back to John Cadman's house again uh, and the Yankee Hill area. Now they're only separated, those two villages, if you will, are only separated by Calvert Street. So it's kind of a contiguous area and we'll give, forgive the governor for confusing them a little bit perhaps. And we don't know why they chose specifically, but they may have gone back to uh, John Cadman's house to see the three young ladies again. That's what I can think. Uh, but at any rate, John Cadman then talks to the press and he learns that probably Yankee Hill still has the upper hand. It's still probably their favorite, but you know, as I said, the city of Lancaster does have some things in its, in its uh, behalf. Uh, but nonetheless, John Cadman is about to make his second big political error. 
the first one is in the division, perhaps, of the county. But the second one is he asks his wife, his wife's sister, and several young ladies from the area to prepare supper for the Capitol Commission that night. Uh, and they're going to have a feast, literally, and they're going to eat outdoors, according to the diary. Uh, and for dinner that night, they're going to have fried chicken, ice cream, and all the trimmings, it said. Uh, they split up their party and uh, spend the night there. Uh, the next day, which I'm thinking may have been a Sunday, I'm not sure, uh, I haven't gone back to check, but the 29th, they're going to not make their deliberations in Yankee Hill. Instead, they're going to come back to the village of Lancaster. It's not totally clear in my mind why they make that decision, but they're going to come back to the village of Lancaster and Captain Donovan's uh, cabin. Uh, and they will go into the upstairs attic of his house. Now, coming back from Yankee Hill, the people in Yankee Hill are going to sort of make a parade. Uh, they will bring the Capitol Commission back, uh, and they will go upstairs, which is the attic, more or less, of this cabin. Uh, and Barry's bar, as I said, is right on one corner of it, and the mill is on the other corner of it. Uh, they'll go into the uh, attic uh, sometime before lunch, 11-ish, I guess. And there they'll begin deliberations. Uh, and as they talk and deliberate, uh, the first ballot they make is for one vote for Ashland and two opposed. There are only three of them. They want a unanimous decision. Now they're going to start talking a little bit more. And one of the things they talk about at this point in time uh, is John Cadman. Then, uh, shortly after lunch, we're told, they come down from the attic, and they're going to go out from the attic, uh, uh, attic out onto the street in front to announce to the teeming throng who is waiting to hear their decision. And when they get down there, there's literally no one there. The people from Yankee Hill, they're sure they've got the capital sewed up. They've gone back home. Uh, there's a small group of boys, one of them a young man by the name of McKesson, uh, whose grandfather was one of the Methodist Protestant Female Seminary Association, eight members, and he was the first uh, physician in the city of Lincoln. He's not only the first physician, but he was also a doctor of divinity, Dr. McKesson was, which was a good deal because, like I, I point out often, if he couldn't save you by medicine, he could fall back on his other doctorate you know, uh, and pray you to health. And if that didn't work, uh, in the best tradition of Methodism, he could take up a collection. You know? But at any rate, these uh, several young boys are coming up this uh, path from having been swimming and fishing in Salt Creek which isn't a very appetizing picture today, perhaps. Uh, but at that time, uh, they were still catching large buffalo fish, which is kind of a Nebraska carp, I think. Uh, and they were fishing at what they called Willow Bend, which is probably third or four, well, probably not far from the present arena, because the Salt Creek used to meander up through there. And it met Oak Creek at about third and T, I think, something like that. They moved that to the other side of the old fairgrounds. But at any rate, they were coming up from having fishing and swimming. And so the Capitol Commission announced to them that the new capital of Nebraska would be the village of Lancaster. And in August, its name would change from Lancaster to Lincoln. And now it becomes curious as to why they chose Lancaster. But now let's go back upstairs into the attic with them and listen to the discussion. Because the second part, after the first ballot, they're going to start talking more seriously about John Cadman and how he is best known as a practical joker and a political joker, if you will. And one of the things they're going to center on is the fact that dinner. What did they have for dinner? Fried chicken, ice cream, and all the trimmings. As they talk, one of the things they begin to talk about is the ice cream. Now, this is the first recorded instance we have of ice cream existing in or being served in the territory or state of Nebraska. Could have existed. This is the first recorded instance. We know that to make ice cream, you need certain things. You need salt. We got that. We need milk or cream. We got that. Eggs. We got all that stuff. Sugar might have been expensive, but we probably got some of that. Probably the most difficult part of making ice cream late in the summer on the edge of the great American desert is ice. Now, the Capitol Commission reasoned that it took all the ice in Lancaster County to make that ice cream. That ice would have had to have been sawn off of creeks or ponds the previous winter 
And they figure it took most all of, if not all of the ice, just to make that ice cream. So in their further deliberations, they agreed unanimously. The ice cream constituted bribery. And for that reason, they voted against Yankee Hill. Now, now you know, 55 minutes later, that Lincoln, the city, is not named in honor of Abraham Lincoln, as everybody assumes. It is a political slur against him, which backfires. And Lincoln, Nebraska, is the capital of Nebraska because primarily of ice cream and mosquitoes. Okay. Now, the other thing we look at at this point in time is at that point, we said we wanted to move the capital as far west as the population would ever grow. So the center of population would be up against that line. Now, if we take a census every 10 years, which we just did, the last census which I know that took and drew an actual line, where was that line north and south where 50% of the population lived to the east and 50% lived to the west? And the answer is seven miles east of the city of Lincoln. So from 1867 to 2010, that line hasn't moved. The great bulk of the population still lives where the Capital Commission originally thought it might. Now at this point, we are right at 55 minutes, which is what we wanted to kind of shoot for, and we will ask if there are any questions, comments. I don't think we have time for corrections. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Plenty of time for any questions or comments, though. Anybody? Yeah. Yeah, and that was one of the places, uh, excuse me, the question was, wasn't there a site up by Cedar Bluffs that was surveyed? Well, it was considered. Uh, and in fact, there are photographs. There's even a uh, street, if you will, named Capitol Hill up there. But nothing ever came of it and was not included in their, in their instructions. And this really came up again more permanently later on because we're going to have later discussions of should the capital not be in Grand Island? In fact, shouldn't the capital of the United States not be in the center of Nebraska, which was the center geographically of the United States? So primarily that area is going to come up later on. But yeah, they did, did look at that area. And yeah, they made maps of it. And in fact, I think they still refer to it as Capitol Hill. Still there. Yeah. Yeah, are there any physical remnants of John Cadman's stage station on Salt Creek? Yeah. Uh, and the way we find those physical remnants are the problem that the Oregon Trail cutoff had, and it, it has many, many names, that Oregon Trail cutoff, the California Road, Oregon Road, lots of roads. In fact, there's a boulder out there uh, off of Saltillo Road and 14th Street, a great big one which has a plaque on it which lists all those roads. One of the problems they had was crossing Salt Creek, which was not nearly, or Salt Creek if you're not from Nebraska. Salt Creek was not nearly as deep as it is today where we, you know, we'd have to get a wagon across, you'd have to go down through a deep swale. So also that trail was probably five or six trails wide. So we have, we see crossings mapped by the federal government, partly, from Saltillo Road to Roca, at least a half a dozen. Now, we have to make some assumption which one of those was John Cadmus. We, we have a fair, fairly good idea. Um, and Sam Van Pelt has done a great deal of mapping and research in this and maybe can pinpoint it even better than I. But as this trail was formed, one of the things that the people on the trail were instructed to do was, as they left Nebraska City, to throw on board a rock. And when you get to Salt Creek, throw the rock out. And of course, some of them would bring two rocks, which is 100% better. But there were so many hundreds and thousands of wagons making this trail that they literally made a stone crossing there. In fact, as many as half a dozen stone crossings. Now, we can find those stone crossings today. And the easiest way to find them is to wait until there's a little ice on Salt Creek. A little. We don't need a lot. Because as Salt Creek has gotten deeper and deeper through the years, uh, through erosion primarily and floods, of course, that stone crossing, those stones will go down. 
But as the larger stones go down, the smaller stones will go downstream a little bit. So you'll have this area of large stones and then trailing off downstream smaller, kind of like this in a graph you could make it. And where the major one was, and we think that's where it is, we can not only see the swale going down into the creek and coming up on the other side, not too much because it erodes away on the outside of that bend right there. But we can see with that form of ice, we can see it just clear as a bell, just like somebody drew a ruler across each one of those. And it's easiest to see when there's a little ice on there. And that's why I said the major crossing is probably not quite a half a mile south of Saltillo Road. And it'll appear on the downside, or the, up, the downstream side on Salt Creek. And as far as I know, that's the only thing we've ever found. Archaeologically, there are the remnants of an Indian village on the west side of Salt Creek up there, uh, which have been identified by the University of Nebraska and reburied. Uh, the site is recorded. But nothing really was ever found archaeologically, uh, and I'm looking at Peter Bleed to see if he knows of anything, uh, at the site of the stage station. There is, we think, maybe a stone building, maybe, further towards Roca. Maybe. It's a, it's a great little building, but we don't know. Uh, there would have been another subsidiary station. Okay, I have more answer than you probably wanted. Another question? Over here, yes. Okay, the next talk, and starting with the next one, we will uh, deviate from what we did today where this was almost all lecture. Starting with the next one, it will be almost all slides, photographs, and comments on each one of them. We will start with John Cadman's house, the formation of the city of Lincoln around the core of what was Lancaster. Uh, we will get into building the first Capitol building and probably we'll maybe get to part of the penitentiary, part of the insane asylum, and in through time the next thing will come up will be the university. So we'll work in that direction. We'll start with the building of Lincoln. But next time we will talk about John Cadman's house specifically and see it. Uh, and the original village. That's March the 12th, is that correct? March the 12th. And I for, you forgot to hold up the sign. The question was what happens in the next, the next session. So that's it, okay, sorry. See, if I don't get the views real cue, I don't, I don't do anything. Time for another question, if you got. If not, I think that takes care of our first session. We have no idea, by the way, how many sessions there are gonna be. Uh, Eileen said 15, it, it could be 15, it could be 20, it depends a little bit on how many questions you have, it depends a little bit on how much I make up as I go along, uh, and a little bit to how much I just stray from what I'm supposed to be talking about. So, so come back again, leave your passports back there if you want, and we'll stamp it again next time. And I think with that, do you have anything else? If not, we are adjourned. Thank you. And I might add that that's my entire notes for today. Okay. And you see, this is just for the first couple of lectures, so I got to start talking faster.